Good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Please, uh, I ask you to mute your microphone before we start. And uh, thank you for joining this lecture entitled uh, Israel Beyond Technology and Apartheid. I am Clara Raffaele and some of you already know me. And I'm a researcher for EOMI and Tatiorap Research. Um, I have my camera switched off because of my bad connection, I'm sorry, but uh, I need to inform you that this lecture will be recorded. So feel free to switch yours off as well if you don't want to be visible. Um, before we start, let me give you a few information about uh, Dr. Abulawa. Susan Abulawa is a Palestinian American writer and activist. In uh, her novels and lecture, um, she analyzes the geopolitical and social situation in Middle East uh, and the impact that Middle East issue has on forced migration to the West. As some of you already know, she was expected to come to South Tyrol last February to hold this conference uh, mm -hmm. in person, but the pandemic forced us to reschedule the event this way. At the end of her speech, Dr. Abulawa will answer our questions. So if you want to intervene, please send a message to me via, via chat and I'll give you the word. As you can see, your, your microphones are uh, on mute, but you are able to unmute them yourself. If you have any questions, please write me in chat. So don't worry. And uh, I really don't want to steal time any longer, so it's my pleasure to leave this uh, online floor to our president, Professor Roland Sander. Yeah, grazie, Clara. Dear Susan, um, Cara Andrea, dear participants and dear co-workers of URAC, uh, a warm welcome from my side as president of URAC Research to a conference which touches a deep wound in humanity affecting millions of refugees and bleeding since at least seven decades. Let me begin with uh, to remind you of one of a very specific aspect, which is very specific from my point of view as an ecologist. In his book, When the Rivers Run Dry, Fred Pierce talks about, as he calls it, the first modern water war. I'm citing from his book. In 1964, Israel hijacked the waters of the Jordan River. There is no other way of putting it. The Jordan Valley, a green desert strip that had been cultivated for longer than perhaps any place on earth, was overnight deprived of most of its water. One day, the Jordan poured out of the Golan Heights into the Sea of Galilee and on down the valley to the Dead Sea, as it had for millennia. The next day, a dam constructed by Israeli engineers blocked its outflow from the Sea of Galilee. Instead, a pumping station lifted the water out of the sea and into a 10-foot wide pipeline that delivered it to the length of Israel. So this was a citation of his book. Last year, I have been in Jerusalem, in Jericho, in Masada, in Tel Aviv, in Akko, in Jaffa, and I saw these enormous walls. But what struck me even more was the situation that I had considered more optimistic before my visit to Israel. I met splendid Palestine women, engineers, medical doctors, and great Israel hosts. And I had a long discussion with a rabbi, a former medical doctor who worked for many years in Italy. And when I asked him, what is your vision for the next 10 years? He replied without hesitation that everything remains as it is now. Dear Susan, I hope there is a better vision and a real hope for Palestine and Israel. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for giving us this uh, seminar. And now I pass over to Andrea Membretti, who will moderate with the, the session, the coming session. Thank you for, for your presence. 
Thank you, Roland. Thank you, President, for your introduction and for your words. Uh, really, uh, it's a, a pleasure and a honor to host, uh, even virtually, Susan Abulawa in this conference. Uh, we really uh, were expecting uh, having Susan with us uh, in South Tyrol uh, in, in February. And as Clara was saying, the pandemic uh, was impeding uh, <laughs> also these, uh, these events, uh, among the others. So uh, just a, a couple of words. Uh, uh, Susan has been invited uh, within our uh, Interreg project uh, EUMINT, uh, Euro Regioni Migrazione Integrazione, so Euro Regions Migration and Integration. And uh, in this project, we focus mainly on refugees and forced migrants with a specific uh, attention to the Alpine regions, to the Alps. And uh, it's important to consider that uh, the Alps uh, have been uh, so long uh, uh, a bridge between different cultures and people. And uh, in the very last years, uh, also in relationship with the new so-called wave of refugees from, uh, uh, from the southern countries, uh, there was uh, this uh, coming back of the borders. Uh, and uh, once again, now during the pandemic, uh, the Alps, uh, uh, turn uh, into, into a border for the people. So it seems that it's very relevant for us uh, discussing about uh, refugees, creating refugees, uh, um, pushing people uh, out from their countries or uh, denying the right of being uh, welcome in other countries. And this is part of the issue, part of the story about our human project and uh, about, of course, the biography uh, of uh, Susan Abulawa as a writer, as a novelist. Uh, and I just uh, would like to uh, remind you uh, the, uh, the novel Morning in Janine, that is really uh, a, a perfect way of uh, discussing and presenting uh, this issue in, um, in a novel. So I don't want to, to waste uh, uh, our time. There will be this uh, possibility to uh, discuss with Susan. I would like to leave immediately uh, the floor to, to Susan. And so please uh, enjoy this conference. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. And, um, uh, and especially um, to, to you, Andrea, and, and to Clara uh, for finally making this happen. Um, oh, God, I'm so sorry. It's my dogs. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to um, present a slightly updated version of the talk I would have presented back in, Feb in February. Um, it delves into the roles um, that Israel plays around the world um, uh, under the cover of a rather extraordinary propaganda campaign. Um, and I think it's very, um, uh, it's, it's excellent, um, Roland, that you touched on the issue of water and ecology because I, I'm going to actually delve into that issue um, a bit more. Um, and so much has happened since uh, I was supposed to be in Italy um, that I actually almost changed my talk um, to be more current with the, with the situation now regarding the pandemic and, um, and the global uprising. Um, uh, that has been propelled by the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but upon some reflection, I think that um, this talk regarding Israel is actually quite relevant um, regarding the um, things that underlie the global unrest now, um, the, atmosphere, the atmospheres of suspicion and surveillance and the general rage all of this produces among the masses. So I'm gonna start um, sharing my screen. Um, I hope this works. It worked when we tried it in the dry run. So um, can you see my screen? Yeah, okay, good. Um, let me put it in present mode. All right, so, um, what I'm going to do is, is present a survey of Israel from multiple angles that, will, that are going to seem um, divergent and unre unrelated, um, including the perception 
uh, of a democracy um, and an environmentally conscious nation. Um, its relationship to the rest of the world through major exports and global friendships, uh, its relationship to history and archaeology. Um, all of these factors uh, contribute to the creation of refugees, to political upheaval and, uh, and instability both in Palestine and around the world. Um, people uh, like me, um, yourselves, and students of history uh, understand the colonial and apartheid underpinnings of Israel, um, which manifests in the unrelenting, merciless daily horrors and indignities against Palestinians. But many in the world still see Israel as this brilliantly diverse nation. Um, the prevailing, uh, the prevailing notion of Israel is as um, a diverse sort of benevolent democracy um, with maybe just, you know, a few problems here and there. Um, this notion is cultivated through a sustained, multi-tiered, multi-pronged public relations campaign that generally present Israel as an unfairly maligned modern democracy, um, one that is technologically advanced uh, as a startup nation, a socially enlightened uh, society with major gay pride parades. Um, and Israel is also presented as being endlessly uh, uh, inventive and, and innovative from the absurd claim of having invented falafel, for example, to the equally absurd claim uh, of being less than a year away from curing cancer. Um, I think this article is actually a year old already, so, um, and they haven't yet cured cancer. Um, we see these wonderful images and articles about Israel everywhere, at least in the United States, that's the case. Um, and rarely are they actually presented as uh, propaganda campaigns. Typically, they here in the US, they appear as articles, legitimate articles by journalists who uh, one presumes to be writing objectively. Um, in fact, uh, that is not the case. What's being promulgated through popular international media is typically not merely an exaggeration of reality or even just spin where there might be a kernel of truth. Um, often, in fact, they are deliberate lies, which are precisely the opposite of reality. A case in point is this article that was published in Scientific American a well-regarded magazine that makes scientific discoveries accessible to the general public. This article touted Israel's desalination plants as unprecedented ingenuity in the region. Um, and, and actually the whole region is presented as rather backward in this article. Um, it uses romantic language that comports with the old proposition that Israel is a miracle that made the desert bloom. There are just two blatant lies in, in just the article, and just the title rather, and the subtitle. The title suggests that Israel is ushering widespread use of desalination, and the subtitle suggests that Palestine, the land on which Israel sits, is a barren, dry land. In fact, Nations in the Gulf region, such as Kuwait, UAE, and even Saudi Arabia, have employed desalination technology for over 50 years. That's about 45 years longer than Israel. But more important is the little known fact that Ramallah's rainfall, or an the annual rainfall of Ramallah, actually exceeds the annual rainfall of London. And Jerusalem's annual rainfall is nearly on par with London. So the point of this is that Palestine isn't and it never was a dry desert barren or, or nothingness as, this, as the body of the article refers to it. 
Um, the article describes Israel as a galvanized civilization that created water from nothingness, where a few miles away, water disappeared and civilizations crumbled. And this sort of harkens back to um, uh, what uh, Roland mentioned earlier. In fact, um, in its very first year of, um, of establishment, Israel began a uh, water diversion project and over pumping from rivers and tributaries to serve Zionist settlements with unsustainable European standards, which were utterly in conflict with the local terrain and which set the stage for a multitude of environmental disasters across Palestine. One example um, among many is Israel's destruction of Palestine natural water system, um, especially, uh, for example, the Al Oja River, uh, which Israel, by the way, ne uh, renamed as the Yarkon. It, um, according to a 19, uh, 1891 travel guide, it was a vigorous coastal river, uh, a roaring river that zigzags until falling into the sea. Its power turns mills and small fish can be caught in it. In a mere decade of Israel's mismanagement of, this, uh, of Palestine's water, this life-giving river was reduced to a trickle of sewage. Its water was siphoned and replaced with toxic sludge of industrial and domestic pollutants, which in 1997, ate through the lungs and vital organs of athletes who were competing in the Maccabee Games, who fell into the river when the bridge, when the bridge collapsed. Um, one of Israel's first water projects when it conquered the rest of Palestine was to divert as much water as possible from the Jordan River once it gained access. And this is exactly what uh, uh, Roland was talking about. This spurred Syria and Jordan to follow suit to preserve their own share of regional water. And decades later, the water levels are so low that the Jordan River can no longer replenish the Dead Sea. And the declining water levels coupled with Israel's evaporation ponds, um, which you can see here in, in the blue at the, the, the southern tip of the, um, uh, of the Dead Sea, um, uh, has created an environmental disaster that has never uh, bef been seen before in Palestine. And um, it has become a cliche really to say that the Dead Sea is dying. Um, and, and that is a, an environmental disaster ultimately with global consequences. In the, uh, in the 1950s, um, shortly after Israel's establishment, Israel um, drained Palestine's Hula wetlands, um, which was a regional biodiversity treasure. It was an extraordinary um, lush uh, um, uh, terrain. Um, and they did that in order to establish Jewish settlements. Hundreds of such colonial projects have greatly denigrated the rich biological and geographic diversity um, in this terrain where three continents meet. Some of the fish and bird species uh, that were destroyed by this project were present nowhere else in the world and have since gone extinct. Um, and these are images of that, uh, of the image of draining the Hula wetlands. Um, so, and this is of course to say nothing of the way that the land itself has been scarred and disfigured. Um, hilltops have been, uh, uh, the, the way that they build settlements is to decapitate hills, uh, which is completely unlike the indigenous Palestinian way of, of building cities and villages and, um, in which homes are integrated into the local terrain. Um, uh, but Israel completely decapitates these hills, which has massive environmental and consequences for wildlife and the, the local ecology. And they, they've also imported millions of fast growing pine trees mostly uh, in order to conceal destroyed Palestinian villages. Um, 
but these these non-native forests um, were ultimately rejected by the land um, in these massive forest fires uh, that have left a scorched earth on hundreds of thousands of acres. Um, and this is to say nothing of the systematic ways in which Israel uproots olive trees and other fruit bearing trees um, that sustain Palestinians. Um, uh, and, 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 and this sometimes much of this destruction has been done in ways that really can never be undone. Um, this is the cover of a highly researched and detailed audit um, of all the ways that Israel has profoundly and detrimentally altered the natural biomes, the landscape, the hydraulic potential, and the ecological balance of Palestine. Um, it's, it's a monumentally depressing read, but um, it reveals that although Israel's role as a destroyer of Palestinian society overshadows their environmental record, um, Israel should nonetheless be counted among the world's great polluters and decimators and spoilers of nature. So now I want to turn to Israeli innovations. Um, because Israel leads the world in several uh, niche death surveillance and suppression technologies. Um, I believe that one way to get a general sense of how societies exist in the world, um, and more especially how they impact the world, is to examine um, its military economy. And national military spending is, uh, um, is, is a good place to start. So we look, when we look at Israeli spending, we find that along with um, that the world's other bastion of human rights, Saudi Arabia, um, it, is the high, it has the highest military spending per capita in the world, exceeding the United States um, military spending per capita, as well as exceeding US military spending as a percent of GDP. Um, other countries like Russia, um, the United States, and China aren't far behind in expenditures. But where the extraordinary difference emerges is with military exports. Um, studies and international databases show that Israel is anywhere from the fourth to the eighth largest exporter of arms, depending on the year and the currency examined. So I should point out, however, that these data are likely gross underestimations because Israel does not ex, uh, report their arms deals, many of which occur through covert deals via independent private arms hustlers who are usually retired uh, military generals. Um, given that Israel is among exporters of arms with far bigger populations and economies, I tried to find data showing exports per capita, um, and I mostly came up empty-handed. And um, uh, uh, so I, I decided to put my scientist hat on and, uh, and, do, and, and do some calculations myself. So I used two databases. Um, the first one was of the top 50 arms exports in US dollars for the years 2010 to 2018. Um, these data were taken from uh, CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, which compiles data on arms transfers and conflicts around the world. And using Excel functions, um, I matched uh, those data up with world population databases from the World Bank for corresponding years. Um, and then using simple arithmetic functions, I calculated and graphed published arm sales that were normalized to the size of the population to determine arms exports per capita for all the countries in the CIPRI databases. And you can see here um, just three examples. Um, but what I found is that Israel leads the entire world in arms exports, often by a huge margin. 
um, and it has done so for every year between 2010 and 2018, with the exception of 2011, um, when apparently Sweden had a, um, a huge um, arms deal or something, and uh, it was neck and neck with Israel. So again, um, these data do not include the vast covert arms transfers, the military training, or the surveillance technology. Um, and uh, so, and for those who don't know, uh, my training is actually in science. So um, I became a, uh, a novelist quite late in life and, and quite by accident, but, um, uh, and I'm happy to provide these data if anyone would like to have them. So it is well known and admitted by Israeli weapons manufacturers that they test their weapons on Palestinians. Um, and Gaza is their greatest laboratory. Um, according to Daryl Lee of the University of Chicago, um, Gaza is a space where Israel tests and refines various techniques of management, continuously experimenting in search of an optimal balance between uh, uh, control over territory and minimum responsibility for its non-Jewish populations. So um, one, of, one of Israel's biggest military hardware niches um, is drones. Over 60% of global drone exports come from Israel. Um, the US is in second place with uh, less than uh, 24%. The attractiveness of Israeli arms is that they boast of being combat tested. Um, a case in point is uh, this uh, drone here called um, the Hermes 900, which was still in, in the testing phase when it was used extensively against civilians in Gaza. And just three weeks after the, that onslaught against Gaza, that murdered over 2,200 people and maimed tens of thousands of people. Israel held a drone trade show that was called Israel Unmanned Systems 2014, in which the Hermes 900 was all the rage for its so-called performance in Gaza. Um, in that assault in 2014, Israel used drones to kill at least 840 people. In the current um, uh, assault on, um, uh, that has actually slowed down since the, since the pandemic, um, Israel was using drones um, called, uh, it was a series called the Cyclone Riot Control Drone Systems that were used to spray aerosols and gas substances from the sky that they were also testing. Um, they were used for the first time against, um, you see that? So that's what um, they were using those um, against uh, uh, for the first time against the, the Great March of Return. And the company um, that makes Cyclone um, claimed to be uh, a leading supplier for police forces um, in different parts of the world uh, and as well as the United States. So the headlines that you're looking at now are um, examples of what happens after these death and suppression technologies are developed and tested on the bodies and the psyches and spirits of Palestinians. So um, we'll look a little bit at their exports. So throughout um, its short history, Israel has been um, one of the uh, most dependable um, exporters of weapons to pariah regimes. Um, especially in situations after weapons embargoes are put in place due to severe human rights abuses. The ones I'm going to show you um, were only revealed due to leaks to, um, because of revolutions or specific investigations. 
um, especially by two Israeli human rights activists, um, Itay Mack and Yair Oran. So in, um, for example, here in South Sudan's civil war, uh, Israel continued to supply the South Sudanese regime, regime with weapons despite an ongoing civil war that had left half a million people dead uh, and four million displaced in five years. Um, Israel's arms sales to, to uh, South Sudan continued despite a UN report that documented extensive and grave human rights violations, including um, drafting of child soldiers, burning of villages, systematic rape, indiscriminate killing, pillaging, destruction of infrastructure. And um, I mean, it was so bad that even the United States um, placed an arms embargo in South Sudan, uh, as well as, of course, the, the, the UN. Um, in fact, so in 2018, um, the former head of the Israeli army's operations was sanctioned by the U.S. Treasury Department um, as an agent who sold over $150 million worth of weapons under the cover of an agricultural company pretending to use the money to build affordable housing in South Sudan. Um, in the Bosnian uh, massacre, um, Israel sold weapons to Serbian forces um, between 91 and 95, which was long after the UN embargo was declared um, in 91. And uh, in 92, when Slobodan Milosevic, um, the president of Serbia at the time, was being described by many um, as the, quote, you know, new Hitler of, of Europe, Israel opened an embassy in Serbia. And um, simultaneously, Serbian forces were creating concentration camps and committing massacres against Bosnian Muslims um, that led to the murder of an estimated 250,000 people, um, as, as I'm sure you know. So um, uh, Ite Mack and, um, uh, and Yair Oran, whom I mentioned earlier, had gathered evidence that um, very high Israeli officials were involved in both arming and training the Serbs during this time. Um, one of the pieces of evidence was, was the diary of Ratko Mladic, um, who was on trial at the ICC for war crimes. Um, and you can, say, you can see here the quote from, uh, from, from his diary. Israel's high court rejected the petition um, from Mac and Oran to um, to to uh, um, to un to declassify rather the uh, the documents pertaining to Israeli arms exports, but um, Israel's High Court rejected that petition, um, arguing that declassifying the documents and exposing Israel's role in the Bosnian genocide could harm Israel's interests. Um, and then, adding insult to injury. Uh, Israel um, was, uh, uh, and I think still is, engaged in revising the history of, of that genocide. So um, Israel supplied Serbia with the weapons while it was known that they were conducting genocide. And while a UN um, arms embargo was in place, is and Israel's high court helped to cover it all up. In uh, Myanmar, we know that Israel continued to transfer weapons to the Burmese army long after they were accused of committing war crimes, and they're still doing it, um, including uh, murder, rape, torture, and the burning of villages that left thousands um, dead and at least 700,000 displaced from the Rohingya Muslim minority population. Um, Israel, Israel was selling arms to Myanmar military well after the European Union and the United States had already imposed an arms embargo on the country. Um, Mac and Oran uh, petitioned the Israeli High Court to stop the state's sales of weapons, um, but the ruling was kept classified. Um, but we do know that uh, Israel continued supplying at least armored land and water vehicles and artillery um, to Myanmar. So again, Israel supplied arms to Myanmar while it was known that ethnic cleansing was taking place and while a UN embargo was in place and Israel's high court helped to cover it all up and even enabled it. Um, in Rwanda, 
um, going back again to the 1990s, here to another horrific genocide um, in which uh, approximately 1 million men, women, and children were massacred in Rwanda in the space of 100 days. Um, it is said to be the fastest pace of genocide in human history. Um, Israel provided the rifles, ammunition, and grenades that made it all possible. Um, Ite Mac, in petitioning the Israeli High Court for declassification of arms transfers, quoted um, the Israeli arms dealer who said, I am actually a doctor, expressing pride for supplying those weapons because, he said, they helped uh, the victims die quickly. Um, Israel's high court uh, ruled that those arms deals will remain secret, um, again, claiming that it would harm Israeli interests to, um, uh, to reveal the extent of, of those deals. So, um, and then adding insult to injury, Israel later backed a move to, at the UN by Rwanda to rewrite this history as part of a larger quid pro quo uh, between uh, Paul Kagame of Rwanda and uh, to take in uh, African ref asylum seekers uh, deported from Israel. So Israel um, supplied Rwanda with weapons while it was known that genocide was taking place and while the UN um, arms embargo was in place and Israel's high court, again, helped to cover it up. Um, again, going even further back to apartheid South Africa. Um, this is the cover of an explosive book when it was published um, by uh, 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 Polo Kau Saransky um, that detailed the never before known extent of cooperation between Israel and the apartheid government of South Africa. So Israel was South Africa's closest ally and its most important arms supplier. And eventually um, it was its only friend in the world um, when most of the world could no longer look the other way uh, from the crimes of apartheid. The coordination between the, the two nations was unprecedented. Um, their respective intelligence chiefs held regular meetings, sharing information and training and surveillance they gave unfettered access to each other's military tactics, missions, and intelligence. Um, and their, their relationship was actually deeper than mere trade and coordination. Um, Israel had a spiritual and moral affinity for apartheid South Africa, which was articulated in the 1980s by Israeli Chief of Staff Rafael Itan, who said, as you can read here, um, uh, um, about uh, referring to blacks in South Africa want to gain control over the white minority, um, just like the Arabs here want to gain control over us. And we too, like the white minority in South Africa, must act to prevent them from taking us over. Um, and then in 1976, just a mere two months after Israel rolled out the red carpet uh, for the South African president, school children in Soweto took to the streets to demonstrate against an imposed racist curriculum. Um, the South African police mowed them down with the guns and bullets that had been supplied by Israel. What shocked the world even more was to finally learn that Israel had offered to provide the, the apartheid government with nuclear weapons as far back as 1975. Um, and Israel actually tried very hard to prevent the declassification of the post-apartheid government documents, but they were unsuccessful when the ANC took power. Um, and it became clear that Israel did indeed lead to the nuclear armament of the apartheid regime, um, which thankfully voluntarily disarmed following the fall of apartheid. Um, and one more uh, one more thing that's worth noting here is that the former um, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert warned that his country, um, Israel, could one day, quote, face a South African style struggle for equal voting rights. And as soon as that happens, the state of Israel is finished. So there are so many examples of uh, 
such violent Israeli subterfuge around the world. Um, I can, I'm going to just very quickly rattle through um, a few examples without going into further detail just for the sake of time, but know that every one of these instances of sub Rosa arms sales or training occurred to bolster repressive, brutal regimes, including colonial powers at different times, as well as training of mercenaries to facilitate corporate plunder, and also, um, and these locations are not at all comprehensive. And, and the vast majority of these, um, of these instances resulted in, in huge uh, refugee um, issues that arose as, as a direct result of the, of the uh, violence and repression. So Israel continued supplying arms to the former repressive um, white colonial regime in Rhodesia, which is um, Zimbabwe, uh, after UN sanctions were imposed in 67. They armed and supported Portugal against national liberation movements in its, in its former colonies in Mozambique, Angola, and Guinea-Bissau. Um, Israel funded and trained, and, and trained the military repression of anti-colonial uprisings um, or dictatorships in the Ivory Coast, uh, the Central African Republic, Benin, Cameroon, Senegal, Togo, Uganda, Nigeria, and Somalia. Um, Israel armed all sides of the Angola civil war at different times over 40 years. Um, they used the, 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 uh, the old colonial tactic that's used in other places to fuel arms and wars to divide and conquer Africa. Um, Israel armed and trained elite units in, um, in uh, former Zaire, the, the current um, Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC. Um, that bolstered the brutal rule of uh, Mobutu Sese Seko uh, after the uh, assassination of the, uh, the, the revolutionary Pan-Africanist Patrice Lumumba. Um, they also sold arms to Sri Lanka to, to suppress the Tamils. Um, Israel provided nearly all, the, all arms sold, that were sold to the Somoza dictatorship in Nicaragua that terrorized Nicaragua for 12 years. Um, following the election of the Sandinistas, Israel funneled arms to the Nicaraguan Contras, um, and they were, they were the conduit um, in what became, many of us will remember as the Iran-Contra affair that played out in, in uh, um, uh, testimonies in Congress here in the US. They likewise sold arms to Guatemalan death squads, as well as death squads in El Salvador and Honduras. Um, uh, they sold uh, arms to Chile during Pinochet's uh, horrific di dictatorship, to uh, Rafael Trujillo during his, um, his dictatorship in the Dominican Republic, uh, to the terrorist Argentinian junta in the 70s. Um, and in nearly all of these places, Israel also sold surveillance um, technologies. The same thing in the Philippines under Ferdinand Marcos and, um, and, uh, and now to uh, Duterte. Uh, also in, in Cameroon um, uh, to Paul Bia, uh, who, who has been crushing political dissidents. Um, in Equatorial New Guinea, in, uh, sorry, Equ Equatorial Guinea, they, um, they have been colluding with uh, Teodoro Obiang in Guema um, and Exxon Mobil to suppress uh, uh, political dissent in that country, um, and 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 also in the U.S. And there was a scandal that just uh, that broke out not that long ago because it was revealed that Microsoft uh, invested in an Israeli startup tech that had been developing facial recognition software on Palestinians, um, and uh, uh, and and the and this surveillance technology actually is being used widely all over the world. Um, Israel, Israel uh, provides countries and companies with uh, uh, wares and training for domestic policing and suppression of dissent. Um, in places like Brazil, Israel has played a huge role in their domestic um, surveillance in prisons and uh, their militarized borders. Um, Bolsonaro is a, is a good friend to Israel. In the United States, um, there is widespread training of uh, US police departments. Um, the export of Israel's brutal tactics to the US has been so alarming 
that Jewish Voice for Peace launched a dedicated campaign called the Deadly Exchange to fight against uh, this phenomenon. Um, over, over 200 police and security agencies, um, actually that number is far higher now, sorry, this, that statistic is quite old, um, in the United States have gone on these all expense paid training junkets to Israel where they are both brainwashed about Israel and they're instructed in ruthless military occupation tactics, um, uh, which are developed on the bodies of Palestinians. Um, the impact of this cooperation between the US and domestic police departments and the Israeli military came to, came, um, came to, to, to light after the Ferguson uprising in which RoboCop police showed up in military gear to suppress um, uh, you know, peaceful demonstrators in the streets. And it turned out that the Ferguson Police Department had gone on one of those fully funded training junkets by the Israeli military. And the Minneapolis Police Department where George Floyd was killed uh, a few weeks ago had also trained in Israel on at least two separate occasions. Um, this is just about the, the surveillance I mentioned um, and the, the uh, Microsoft. Um, but I want to show you actually some uh, images that are um, uh, relevant to today. Um, you can see these are, these are the, the technology, the, the detainment, whatever you want to call them, strategies that Israel has uh, popularized in the United States through the, this extensive police training. Um, these images show how Israel has been dealing with Palestinians for years. The, the choking um, with the knee on the neck um, and the choking with this sort of headlock that also killed Eric Gardner in 2000 and I think it was 16 um, or 2014 or 2016, I can't remember, um, when Eric Gardner was killed in the same way uh, and he, while he was telling them, I can't breathe. There have been a lot of Palestinians who actually died or, or suffered brain damage um, from, from this technique. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's how it exists now in the US. So um, I want to move now to uh, friendships. Israel has been a true friend to anti-Semites and fascists and homophobes all over the world. Um, despite claiming to be the guardians and protectors of Jews everywhere, in practice, Israel has courted the world's most notorious anti-Semites as long as they support their occupation and they buy Israeli arms. So here I mentioned, John, I mean, I mentioned the president of, uh, the prime minister rather of apartheid South Africa, John Vorster. Um, he was a Nazi sympathizer with ties to the Grey Shirts, a uh, fascist militia who was imprisoned by the British for his Nazi ties during World War II. Uh, in 76, Yitzhak Rabin helped uh, praise, heaped praise on him rather, um, and uh, gave him a red carpet welcome when he visited Israel. Israel has uh, cozied up to uh, and is supporting ultra-nationalist, ultra-right-wing, anti-minority, racist, homophobe uh, 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 Bolsonaro in Brazil, who said uh, refugees are the scum of the earth. He told a female colleague she was too ugly to rape. He threatened to destroy or imprison political opponents. He spoke favorably of torture. He laments the Brazilian cavalry wasn't as efficient as the Americans to exterminate the Indians. He said he'd rather his son die in a car crash than hear he was gay. So you know, you know him, you know this man very well, I'm sure. Um, Israel has also developed um, close ties uh, and has been arming and training anti-Semitic neo-Nazis in the Ukraine. Um, Israel likewise has opened its doors to anti-Semitic Prime Minister of Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban, who praised their World War II era leadership that presided over the mass murder of Jews and employed terrible uh, age-old anti-Semitic tropes to demonize George Soros, for example. 
um, uh, last December, um, Israel uh, met with him to negotiate the opening of a revisionist Holocaust museum in Budapest um, that basically exonerated Hungary's role in Europe's Holocaust. Um, Netanyahu has signed a joint declaration with right-wing Polish Prime Minister uh, Matusz Morawiecki, um, which like, likewise wipes clean Poland's record in Europe's Holocaust um, and, uh, and helped to rewrite the history to state that the Poles were actually helping Jews escape Nazis. Um, of course, there's this uh, uh, card-carrying anti-Semite um, that Israel embraces and loves. Netanyahu even went so far as to make excuses for Hitler, claiming in 2015 that Hitler wasn't the monster we all thought he was. Rather, it was this it was a Palestinian, Hajj Amin al Husseini, who, <clears throat> who convinced him to actually kill European Jews. Um, luckily, uh, Netanyahu crossed a line with that one, and leaders and historians all, of, all across Europe kind of rose together to give Israel a foul card. Um, the last bit I want to touch on is the, are the ways that Israel is rewriting um, history and robbing the world of archaeological treasures and important history that belongs not only to Palestinians, um, but to all of humanity. Um, because Palestine is an extraordinarily special place. Um, uh, while it already has an indigenous population that arose organically over millennia, Palestine holds history that belongs to all peoples of monotheistic faith, um, certainly to Christians and to Muslims, as well as Jews. So, um, mosques and churches. Um, since its inception, um, Israel has worked tirelessly to erase the footprints of the many civilizations religions and ethnicities that existed in the land before Israel um, uh, was established. Um, uh, and before, you know, before and after uh, the hist historic Jewish presence in that land. Um, the existence of so many churches and mosques are uh, particularly irritating to Israel. Um, and it has worked in earnest to destroy desecrate or control um, and control them in general from the beginning of their control over the land. Immediately after the Nakba, Israel began a campaign of destroying the Palestinian villages it had just depopulated, including tearing down mosques and churches, some of which were centuries old um, and of great religious and historic significance, like the Sheikh Eid Mosque in Jerusalem that was built by uh, Salah Eddin's son in the 1100s, um, in places where new Jewish inhabitants took over Palestinian towns, non-Jewish places of worship have been turned into nightclubs, um, uh, brothels, um, animal pens, restaurants, uh, and such. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about my dogs, they're usually better behaved, but um, anyway. Um, the older mosques were, uh, were often made inaccessible um, and declared closed by uh, using closed military zones, um, which left them derelict. And eventually, because they would fall into disrepair, they would say, oh, this is a hazard, and they would just tear them down. So as a result, um, hundreds of ancient um, mosques and buildings have been destroyed without really much um, worldwide attention at all. Um, when the Islamic movement once helped a group of internal refugees from the former village of Sarafand restore their mosque in the year 2000, um, under the cover of night, a bulldozer, they sent a bulldozer um, and, uh, and toppled the entire thing. Um, increasingly, Jewish uh, militias are vandalizing and burning churches and mosques, um, and uh, uh, and very little consequences to to the perpetrators. As a matter of fact, in 2010, the U.S. State Department published a report in which it stated non-Jewish holy sites in Israel do not enjoy legal protection. Uh, because the government does not recognize them as official holy sites. Um, 
After Jewish settlers torched a mosque in 2012, the former military chief of staff admitted in a radio interview that there was no interest in catching the culprits. Um, he said, quote, if we wanted, we could catch them. And when we want to, we will. Um, so cemeteries, um, part and parcel of Israel's erasure of history, um, they have also targeted non-Jewish cemeteries. Um, the ancient Muslim cemetery of Ma'manillah, uh, which includes graves of prominent Muslim scholars, generals, and even companions of the Prophet Muhammad, um, was destroyed. And uh, on top of it, they built a museum by the California-based Weisenthal Center. Um, in 2008, more than 100 skeletons were unearthed and tossed aside in excavations to prepare for the construction work. Um, throughout Palestine, where in places where Israel developed um, Jewish cities, Muslim and Christian cemeteries were simply dug up and built over. Um, for example, Tel Aviv University, um, which was built over the Palestinian village of Sheikh uh, Munis, desecrated a graveyard and built a dormitory over it. Um, last year, um, uh, actually a few months ago, Israel demolished an 18th century Muslim cemetery in, um, no, I'm sorry, actually this was just, this was this year, it was a few, it was about 10 days ago, it was June of this year. Um, Israel began demolition of an 18th century Muslim cemetery in Jaffa. Um, this ongoing colonial strategy to slowly remove all traces of the indigenous population um, and, uh, uh, and destroy, slowly destroy their history and their homes and heritage um, is, is what I like to call imperialism by the inch. Um, and the last bit is, uh, is on archaeology. So as you all know, this, this fabled land is replete with layers and layers of extraordinary history. Um, and Israel has actually weaponized archaeology. Um, on on pretense, for example, of digging for history, it has confiscated and demolished whole Palestinian neighborhoods. Um, and Silwan in East Jerusalem is the best known example of this, um, where Israel confiscated at least six dunums um, of land that uh, belonged to, the, the, to one family, um, the Siam family, and evicted at least 6,000 uh, families, uh, sorry, 6,000 people. Um, and the pur purpose of the dig was never about archaeology um, because we know uh, that they're planning to build a so-called Jewish national park in the area. That was the plan. Um, it's a kind of Jewish Disneyland um, that it's being referred to. We also know that um, the Israeli antiquities authorities have destroyed several ancient art, um, archaeological sites and, and, and antiquities um, as a result of this dig, including a cemetery dating back to the Abbasid Caliphate um, and relics dating back to the Canaanite era um, in the second era millennium, um, in the second BC, uh, millennium BC, sorry. Um, and, and these digs are not for a love of history or archeology. span In fact, Israel routine, routinely destroys ancient cities that are unearthed by archeologists. Um, so long as they have nothing to do with Jewish history. And there's a lot of those. Um, the, the first thing, um, as a matter of fact, that Israel did, literally the, um, the, the, the next day after they conquered Jerusalem in 1967, was to demolish an 800, the entire 800-year-old Moroccan quarter in Jerusalem um, that displaced hundreds of Palestinians. Um, Israel has engaged in this m massive destruction of antiquities uh, in a very consistent, <coughs> uh, a very consistent and systematic uh, way. Um, another uh, example is a recent find of a 1,200-year-old mixed village of well-off um, Christians and Muslims who live together. Um, as a matter of fact, archaeologists didn't even get a chance um, to, uh, to do much. All, all they could do was uh, take some photos 
and record as much of the relic of as many of the relics as they could um, before bulldozers came in uh, to demolish the site for development of some kind of uh, industrial park. And again, <laughs> these are all just surveys of the surface um, uh, of, of a tremendous amount of, of hidden realities. Um, the depredations of Israel are much more vast, they are deeper and far more reaching. Um, but my hope is that what I presented here will at least help expand the view of Israel uh, from an apartheid nation that's suppressing the indigenous population to a deeper understanding of Israel as a global force of violence, plunder, paranoia, surveillance, greed, war, suppression, ecological destruction, erasure of history, the forceful transfer of wealth from the weak to the powerful, and the entrenchment of supremacist ideologies that set human hierarchies and castes. No matter how many gay pride marches they hold or how many Eurovisions they host, no matter how good their national orchestra touring the world makes you feel, or how the Palestinian citizens given a symbolic vote, um, or no matter how much greenwashing or pinkwashing or whitewashing propaganda there is in the mainstream media, the way that Israel exists in the world is ultimately antithetical to life. It is antithetical to liberty, not just for Palestinians, but for every people that struggles against tyranny, oppression, and ecological destruction. Um, the, the, the situation is quite dire, um, but I, but I, I, I want to uh, end on a, a little bit of hope. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there, there is a lot of movement here in the world, in, in the United States, and I think in the world, um, where the masses are, uh, are, are really making their voices heard. Um, there, are, there is tremendous solidarity from various um, uh, oppressed communities, both within the United States, like Black Lives Matter and indigenous movements. Um, and of course, there is the tireless uh, resistance of Palestinians themselves. Um, and uh, and these, are just, uh, these are just some images, uh, recent images from the, uh, uh, from the rebellions happening in the United States and around the world and the connections that are being made by activists, um, which have a long tradition of reciprocal solidarity around the world. So um, thank you very much. I think I may have go gone a little bit over time, um, but uh, uh, thank you for listening to me. And I apologize again for my dogs uh, for their intrusion. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Suzanne, for uh, inspiring uh, and, and lecture. Uh, yes, we are a bit uh, over time, uh, and uh, I think there are several uh, questions from uh, from the audience. I uh, don't want to to, to waste uh, this uh, uh, occasion. Uh, I also would uh, like to ask you something, but I would start uh, leaving the floor, uh, Clara, if you have uh, uh, questions from uh, from the participants from the chat. Uh, so I would start from this side of the. The participants. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Suzanne, also from my side, and uh, um, I'm going to give the word to Asnan Shabir, who has a question for for you. So please. Yeah. Asnan. Now there is the there is a question from the president in the chat. Maybe you would like to take it. Yeah, let's see here. Um, uh, yeah, I didn't hear anything from Adnan, um, but I see here from Roland. To me, it's hard to understand how a people who has experienced oppression and murder during centuries. Um, I'm sorry, been... Suzanne. I'm sorry, Suzanne. Adnan Shabir was uh... okay. Yes, he's, co he's connected evening. now. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I am Hassan Shabir from Azad Kashmir, Pakistan. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, that, that was a very good session from uh, uh, Suzanne's side. Uh, so my question is, uh, Israel became the member of UNO uh, during the 1940, 90, if I'm not wrong. 
the purpose of UNO was to establish uh, international peace and disarmament. And if we can observe the ongoing uh, situation of the world and uh, the situation of when we can compare it with UNO's objectives or purposes, uh, don't you think that UNO is not taking the stand on the principles that were set right after World War II? This is my question. Um, thank you for that question. It's, it's, um, uh, I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, the terms of the terms of Israel's acceptance to the UN um, were that, and they also the other important terms um, for their acceptance was their acceptance of UN Resolution 194, and uh, 194 stipulated the return of the indigenous population that had been recently made refugees, the Palestinians. Um, so. Uh, you know, given that Israel has not actually fulfilled its, the, the terms of its acceptance to the UN, um, there really is complete grounds and legal basis for them to be expelled from the UN, and I think they should be. But unfortunately, the United Nations has really not had, uh, has, has just really kind of given just a lot of talk and has had no, no real teeth and no, no real enforcement of, of their own resolutions. Um, and, uh, and by the way, you know, I'm sure you know this, um, being from Pakistan, that Israel has also supplied India extensively with weapons um, that are used in Kashmir, uh, at, you know, now. Exactly, sorry if I'm interrupting you. Basically, I am from Kashmir. Uh, I am living uh, uh, right, right behind the line of control that is called LOC, line of control. Mm -hmm. And we, the people of Kashmir, are suffering. Uh, my grandfather, paternal, and my maternal grandfather, they came, they migrated from Indian, of, from, from Indian Kashmir to aid in Pakistan in 1947 at the time of partition for the peace. But you know what actually is going on right now? At here in uh, Azad Kashmir, that is under Pakistani administration, in Azad Kashmir line of control and in Indian occupied Kashmir, the situation is same. India is targeting the people of Azad, Jammu and Kashmir at line of control on a daily basis. I yeah. have interviewed so many people. And, and but one, one more point I would like to mention at here, uh, since long, I tried to mention all the, uh, all the things with evidence to Antonio Guter, that, that he is the general, secretary general of UNO on Twitter. Please kindly, uh, just one time, raise this issue of Kashmir because you are the head of most world's largest peace organization. So being a Kashmiri, I... Hmm. So it sounds like we lost audio. Yeah, please. Yeah. I, I would like to leave uh, room also to, to other uh, questions uh, as there are uh, in, in the chat and, and from the participants. So, um, Clara, would you like to? Last question, if, if, if you can hear me. My last question is, according to the ground realities, this is my question for the rest of the world. UNO should be mandated or End it. This is my question because UN is not following their objectives, aim mm -hmm. that was settled right after the World War II. Being a uh, this is my question. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I honestly, I don't feel qualified to to answer that, and um, and I, but I, you know, personally, I, you know, uh, I do see. Uh, I don't think, I, I personally don't feel that the UN should necessarily be disbanded. The UN is really a problem, um, <clears throat> but it has also given rise to, um, to, organi to, to UN affiliated organizations like UNESCO, for example, that I think has been um, hugely important, especially you know, for Palestinians and, and uh, you know, for the preservation um, and a lot of organizations that work for the preservation of non-human life 
which, you know, I think as humans, we, we, we never really acknowledge and, and don't pay much attention to. Um, but that's something that I, I, I am deeply involved with and I, and I care deeply about um, uh, animals and wildlife and, and our ecology and, and the world that we live in and the rights of, of non-human life to live uh, unmolested by us. So the UN does, does serve um, important functions in, in arenas, um, even at the same time that they contribute to some of the problems that people like you and I have. And I do appreciate you bringing up Kashmir, and I want to acknowledge your passion and the pain and, and the desire to, to, get, to get a few words in there because, because there's not enough attention on Kashmir and what has been happening there. And, um, and it, it, it is a travesty and it's, and it's an abomination what the world is allowing to happen in Kashmir. So um, solidarity, my brother, I hear you. Um, and I acknowledge that for sure. Thank you so much. Sarah, please. There Can are... you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, yes, please. So please, President, President Zenner. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Susan, for this uh, wealth of information I was not aware of. And thank you also for your comment on Kashmir. Uh, if you read Arundhati Roy, yeah, you get also an impression what's going to happen there. And I agree 100% with your notion that we should be responsible also for non-human lives. Uh, yeah, I have a, a very simple question. To me, it has always been so hard to understand how a people that has suffered so much during history has now become a murderer and suppressor itself. And therefore, my question is very simple. Is there a way out? Or do is the best uh, vision we, we may have still leave everything as it is? Um, so uh, definitely not leave things as they are, because things as they are, are um, uh, will, will, will probably lead to our extinction, <laughs> um, which may not be a bad thing for the planet, who knows. But um, look, I think sometimes there is this um, sort of disbelief about how can Jews do this, right? Because we have this, we, we have been taught endlessly that um, Jews are the ultimate victims of, you know, around the world. Um, first of all, that is not entirely true because it is definitely true of European history, but that is not true of Muslim history um, or of the Middle East in general, where, where Jews and Jewish communities have lived and thrived for millennia. From, uh, from, from Baghdad to Iran, Morocco. I mean, there are ancient, com ancient Jewish communities that had lived there prior to the establishment of Israel. So that's one thing. Um, but you are right that it was, it was the people who suffered under European anti-Semitism and, and oppression and suppression who ultimately founded Zionism and, and became the colonizers. Um, and again, you know, this isn't, I mean, on an individual level, like as individuals, we know that people who are abused oftentimes become, come the, become the biggest abusers as individuals. Um, and I think that it seems that the same principle applies uh, in, in the collective. Um, and uh, sorry, I don't know what's happening on my screen, but anyway, um, uh, you know, for example, you know, Liberia was, was established by um, formerly enslaved Americans um, who, who uh, were sort of sent back to Africa, quote unquote, and, and ended up becoming uh, enslaving local, local uh, population themselves. But we have to, but, but the thing is that I think we have to look, be, we have to sort of not hold on to these sort of mythologies that victims can't possibly do something, number one, um, and they can't possibly be, be victimizers. And, and Edward Said really wrote this wonderful essay in which he addressed this very issue that you're talking about. And he talked about how the world has such a problem comprehending this because we are victims of the victims. And, um, and that's true. And, it, and I hear that echo in your question. 
this disbelief uh, uh, that they could actually do that. In fact, and I'll point this out, and this may be another bit of information that you, that you didn't know. In 2011 or 2012, I believe it was, there, were, there was a group of Jewish um, uh, lawyers and, and Holocaust uh, reparations organizations who petitioned the um, Red Cross to open their archives that were sealed. Um, and the purpose was, was to uh, further reparations claims in European courts and in American courts. And when they did that, when the, 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 the Red Cross did open its archives, um, some, what, there, a lot of things were revealed. Among them was the fact that um, Israel had at least, I believe it was 13 concentration camps in Palestine. They were forced labor camps in which Palestinian, uh, Palestinians were uh, how, warehoused um, and uh, forced to forced to work for Israelis, um, especially when they were plundering and looting Palestinian homes in the early days of uh, of the establishment of Israel. And these concentration camps, these forced labor camps, were actually manned by some of the uh, some of the, the 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 European Jews who had been freed from concentration camps themselves. So yes, it happens. It happens on an individual level and it happens on a national level and a collective level. And, um, and, but that should not be our point. That is not the point. The point is that um, as human beings, we are capable of, 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 of great good and great evil, uh, regardless of who we are. And, 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 and we have to let go of these notions that um, any group of people is an eternal victim or an eternal villain and whatnot. Um, so, so I think, you know, that's a place to start. Israel's violations of, of international law, their, their human rights violations, their, their terrorism, the state terror, the colonialism, the destruction of, of, of life and history and heritage is well documented. It is, it is there for everyone to see. And, you know, uh, and nobody, nobody wants to do anything about it. And interestingly, the only time anyone wants anybody, you know, moves a finger is when Palestinians act, is when we, and, and usually when we act in a spectacular way with violence. That is when the world is like, oh, we have to do something. But in the meantime, Palestinians are killed on a daily basis, humiliated, robbed, terrorized on a daily basis, and, and that's kind of the norm. But what hits the news cycles is when Palestinians retaliate or, or resist in some way. Um, so, I mean, and that's a problem. So, thank you. The way out, I was asking for the way out, if there is any. I'm sorry, okay. So, thank you. And uh, then I give the word to Cristina Della Torre, please, Cristina. Yeah, good afternoon also from my side. Thank you uh, for the touching presentation, Mrs. Ablawa. My question is actually related to uh, Mrs. Mr. Sander one. And what I wanted to ask you is whether actually there are counter movements uh, within Israeli population or uh, Jewish population, like the examples you made of the US Jewish for Peace. Um, and these movements um, could be maybe the seed to stop Israel states and enterprises violence um, and start change from within. Thank you. Thank you. So um, this is this actually ties well into Roland's last question is what is the way out? Um, look, the we have we have a uh, we have a system, we have conventions, we have uh, the infrastructure to deal with uh, the kind of imperialism, colonization that Israel is engaged in. But there has been no political will. So, you know, there's the ICC, there's the UN, there's, there's all, there's, there, there are sanctions, there's all manner of tools 
that have been employed mostly against African nations or Middle Eastern nations and, and you know, darker nations rather. Um, but nothing, but no one, there's no political will at the level of the leaders to do anything when it comes to Israel. So, but, but they should, they should do that. But we are left with the fact that it's not happening. So because of that, Palestinians themselves have launched um, the boycott and divestment and sanctions campaign. And that is a tool of resistance that the whole world can engage in. Um, citizens, normal, just ordinary people everywhere can engage uh, uh, in this nonviolent, popular mode of resistance where people can, can express solidarity with the oppressed when the leaders, when world leaders are failing to act and they're failing abysmally. So, um, so, so, so for starters, number one, just, you know, to, to, to summarize that answer, we have the infrastructure and, and we need to push leaders to utilize that infrastructure. Um, concurrently, uh, people should follow Palis the Palestinian lead on, on their own liberation agenda. And Palestinians have chosen uh, a, a boycott campaign similar to what brought apartheid South Africa to its knees. Um, that is something anyone can engage in. Um, and, uh, and, and when, you know, there's also a cultural boycott aspect of that, and it is to engage in uh, uh, lobbying artists and, and, and scientists and businesses not to engage with Israel. I mean, this is the only thing we have left to, you know, it, and that is the, the solidarity and goodwill of people around the world. So there's that. Now to your quest, to your comment, um, Christina, regarding movements within Israel. Um, so I think that's fine, you know, but, but I don't, I think it's, uh, 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 it's unfair to um, expect Palestinians to wait for um, uh, Israelis to have a conscience and, and do the right thing. And we know historically that that doesn't happen. Um, uh, except within small, uh, uh, marginalized groups. And the groups you're talking about actually are very small and they're very marginalized and they're considered outcasts within Israel. Um, and uh, including, for example, there, there's a group of young people, they're called refuseniks, who refuse to, uh, uh, to serve in the Israeli military, um, as they have said to... Um, uh, they refuse to oppress, uh, starve, etc. Uh, Palestinians. Um, there's a group called Breaking the Silence. This is a group of Israelis who, uh, former Israeli soldiers, who themselves had participated in um, terrorism against Palestinians uh, uh, in, in human rights violations. And after years, their conscience has um, uh, propelled them to to speak about what they have done and what they have seen others do, and the stories are horrific. Actually, um, I would encourage you to to get a glimpse of what the daily realities are like for Palestinians by reading testimonies from the soldiers themselves who were engaged in um, uh, you know a, a contest to 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 see who can shoot the most Palestinian knees and things like that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and there are a few noteworthy personalities, some journalists like Amira Haas and Gideon Levy, who do write about um, the realities on the ground. But the, that sector of Israeli society is so small. Um, and, and, uh, and, and they are actually quite insignificant within Israel. The vast majority, I think it was something like 94% of Israelis during 2014 supported um, what essentially was, a, like, according to the questions, was basically carpet bombing Gaza. So I don't really, um, I, don't, I don't hold uh, a lot of faith in that. Um, in the same way in the United States, you know, the white people in this country don't move to act on their conscience just because they're, they're, they're troubled by um, pangs of their conscience. They are moved to act because black people in this country rebel because they rise up. 
Um, and that's what's happening. And, and I, I would never think that I'm going to wait for, for white people in this country to fix racism, but rather, you know, as a Palestinian, as a woman, as a human, I, I follow the lead of, uh, of black people and black organizations in this country to tell me what I need to do to be, to stand in solidarity. It is, you know, it's a resistance we wage alongside them under their leadership of how, uh, how their liberation should be conducted, not how white America needs it to be conducted. And the same applies for, for Palestine and Israel. Israel is an oppressor. They are a colonial state. They came with all the racism, all the, 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 the degradation of, of brown people that existed in Europe at the time, and they applied it to Palestine. It's that simple. And, and, um, and that really needs to, needs to really break through the perceptions that people have about Israel um, being this sort of miracle refuge and savior and whatnot. Thank you again, please, Francesco Palermo. Oh, thank you. Um, very brief, I just uh, wrote it on the uh, chat. Um, uh, I was wondering about your um, opinion uh, on the situation uh, that is now uh, unfolding after the new uh, cabinet that has been formed in Israel, whether you think that it might give some uh, sign of hope uh, to, you know, reverse or at least to uh, ease a little bit the uh, policy of the Netanyahu uh, government so far, uh, or whether the fact that the uh, United Arab List uh, is now marginalized in uh, the Knesset uh, will um, actually, yeah, make the government continue along the same line. Thank you. So the short answer is no. Um, and Clara's telling me I need to, to give shorter answers. Um, uh, regardless of who's in power in Israel, the basic, um, the basic premise and the basic strategies Israel has employed from the, since its inception has not changed. It has always been about colonizing Palestine, taking maximum land um, with minimum ind indigenous Palestinians. And that has not changed and it will not change. Whether or not Israel annexes um, the Jordan Valley now or next year, we know it's in their plans and they're going to, they're going to implement it one way or another. Um, this has always been the plan. There was never, uh, 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 you know, I think the whole world, including Palestinians, were fooled with Oslo, thinking that um, uh, this was going to be a genuine peace. But as the world knows now, it was really just a way to quell the first intifada and, and, and buy Israel more time to continue colonizing under the guise of, of negotiations. So, um, and, and much of that occurred under a labor, uh, under labor governments. So whether it's the Likud, labor, the, the home front, um, ra rather the home party, it, it, you know, the, the policies don't change. It's just that, it's just, it's the same way that, you know, in the United States, we had this, this, this beautiful, brilliant African-American president. Um, but all he did was put a black face to bombing um, Pakistan, to drone killing, to more war, uh, to more corporate, corporate uh, tax breaks and, 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 uh, uh, and, and suppression. So um, that's what, you know, that's what happens in Israel. So that, you know, you get a few labor leaders and, and everybody sort of thinks, oh, this is going to be better. And maybe Palestinians get, you know, get one of the apartheid roads paved instead of having to, to drive on potholes. And that's the extent of it. So no, it does not make a difference ultimately. But the only thing that's going to make a difference is international action to isolate Israel one way or another, whether that's done at the leadership level or at the level of um, or at the level of the, of the people around the world isolating Israel. That's, to me, that's the only thing that, that can uh, affect any change. That is the only way um, change was really able to, to uh, be affected in other places as well. So this is a, you know, we, we know this from history. 
Thank you. Glenda, please. Glenda? Okay, so let's go on. Andrea, maybe? Yeah, thank, uh, thanks, Clara. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, in, in your words, uh, um, you, you, you describe um, a strategy of uh, creation of uh, refugees uh, in Palestine by Israel. So it's, it's clear that uh, in, in, uh, in your opinion, there is uh, this, uh, this strategy, this uh, appropriation of resources, uh, this expulsion of people and, and so on as part of uh, um, even an ideology in this sense. So I am wondering if uh, talking about the role of uh, Israel um, worldwide uh, in the market of weapons and all, all of the issues uh, uh, discussed in your, in your talk, uh, in your speech, uh, do you see any kind of uh, global strategy in this sense? So, I mean, the creation of refugees is part of a, of a global strategy of securitization, of exclusion, of appropriation of resources, in your opinion, and is Israel having a, 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 a guiding role, an important role within this strategy? Um, I think Israel plays a tremendous role. And, uh, and of course, they're not the only ones, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to say that the whole, all the world's ills are, should be placed on Israel's shoulders. Um, but Israel does play uh, a very important role, if not directly, often as a conduit. Um, so, for example, you know, when, when the United States wants to perpetuate some kind of war or whatever, but we can't, you know, we have uh, maybe congressional stops or something to that you know, they, they go to Israel and Israel conducts, you know, sometimes this um, subterfuge that the U.S. or other nations can't get away with on the international scene. Um, I think, like, so much of, so much of, of, of the refugee crises, it's not just one, um, and in the things driving it, whether it's war, whether it's political suppression, whether it's environmental disasters um, uh, and climate change, um, so so much of 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 these um, underlying issues are interwoven together, and they are all tied in some way to capitalism and to to patriarchy and this. Um, and notions of supremacy. Um, so all of these things go hand in hand, capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, you know, misogyny. Um, sometimes they're not even, sometimes they're not even, uh, uh, they're inseparable basically. Um, I, I think, and this is something that underlies a lot of the demands by young people today, which is sort of this implement, which is, basically an eradication of, of capitalism as this rapacious, endlessly consuming system that invites this kind of uh, accumulation of wealth that, that remains unchecked. And it invites the exploitation and the destruction of other peoples and other societies to steal their resources. I mean, if you look at the war, you know, the destruction of Iraq and everything that has ensued in the Middle East since then, I mean, it was, it was driven by, and to a large part, by capitalist interests and, and, and stealing other people's resources. So I think, I think really as societies, we really have to begin to imagine a world beyond capitalism. Um, and I think young people today are, are doing exactly that. I think at least here in the United States, um, where, where a huge portion of the country doesn't have access to healthcare in a pandemic, you know, a lot of these things are driving the current rebellions. Um, I don't know if it'll happen in, in, you know, in my lifetime, but I do see the seeds of change. You know, you see it with, uh, with 
the global youth movement against climate change that, you know, of which uh, Greta Thunberg has been the face of, but which she's not alone. You know, there's a lot of young people, um, uh, uh, indigenous youth and, and African youth who have been doing this for a lot longer than she has. But nonetheless, you know, she's, she's a wonderful example of, of the ways that young people are, um, are engaging and taking charge of their own future. So, you know, I, I derive a lot of hope from that. Um, and I do think that, you know, again, leading, following the lead of people who are most impacted by our actions is, is, is a good, um, is a good rule of thumb to follow. But I do feel that so much of, um, of our world and the ills can, can be, they all rest on these notions of, of supremacy and capitalism. Okay, so we have time for one more question, and it's uh, from Glenda. Hello, good evening, ma'am. Good evening from the Philippines. Hi. I don't know if this is a question, but uh, considering the nature of your job as a novel writer, you're disclosing what are the realities on the ground through your novel. Have you received any criticisms or threats in your life as a writer? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I have. Um, I think any, I mean, yeah, many times, even before I became a writer, when I, when I was, uh, before I became a novelist, when I was writing mostly political essays um, or, yeah. I mean, I think any, you know, you, you, you um, the worst was one time when uh, uh, my daughter was actually threatened and she was a, she was a small child and, and I actually had to call the authorities for that. Um, but yes, and actually all of my friends who are activists, I don't really know a single one who hasn't been threatened in one way. Um, we've all been called anti-Semites. We've all been um, harassed as such. Um, but you know, that's, um, there's kind of a joke in our community that um, you, you made it when when they target you <laughs> like oh it means you're you're important that you're doing something good um uh and I, I don't mean to make light of it i don't mean to make a joke of it but this is our reality and but it's but it's actually a small a very small thing compared to what um our families and our loved ones and our friends go through in palestine so um i do see that there are other questions in the chat i don't know clara if you yes mind. Yes, there's Samantha for the last for the last question. So please, Samantha. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for uh, your lecture. It was extremely interesting and extremely informative. My question is: How do you explain the fact that Jewish intellectuals um, of Israeli and non-Israeli origin, like Moshe Zuckerman, Ilan Pape, Mikko Pellet, Evelyn Hechgalinsky, Gideon Levy, Moni Ovadia, Shlomo Sand, and exponent of the ex-soldiers from the movement Breaking the Silence, just to mention a few of them, who have a critical position on Israeli politics, practically never get interviewed in European mainstream media. And do they get space in US and mainstream media? No. No, they do not. Um, and uh, I'm actually uh, friends with most of the people on that list. Um, and, you know, as you know, for example, Ilan Pape left uh, um, Israel and he, he lives in, in the UK and teaches at Oxford because he was basically hounded by, uh, um, by Israelis and his life was threatened. Um, Miko Pellet also lives in the US and he, even though he's, he comes, you know, he's the son of uh, one of the founders, one of Israeli generals, um, he uh, he has been hounded there as well and marginalized. In general, these voices are they're marginalized within Israeli society and they're given no airtime here in the U.S. and um, apparent clearly not in Europe, um, which really should make people think. You know why is that? What why doesn't our media? Because you know we hear in the U.S. people have this perception of us having a free media and and whatnot, which again is a lie. It's it's very much corporatized and it very much answers to big money and big donors and and uh, and, and whatnot. So, okay. 
Okay, Clara. It seems that we we are running out of time. So um, I would like uh, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Susan, for this uh, precious occasion of uh, uh, discussion, interaction, presentation. Of course, uh, it's uh, it's it's very it's very uh, challenging. It's very difficult now coming back and and and, and discussing these issues uh, with. Uh, optimism but i i do believe that we must be optimistic uh, and uh, as you were uh, saying uh, these new movements uh, also in these days in the us uh, are are teaching something us uh, also about uh, the new crisis uh, uh, related to covid-19 and all these new forms of segregation and uh, and uh, um, and ghettoization of people so I, I think that this was a really uh, a good occasion of, uh, of confrontation. I, I would like to uh, thank especially the Winter School of Federalism uh, with the Francesco Palermo and Greta Klotz because uh, this uh, event was uh, uh, thought and was organized in the beginning within uh, uh, the School of Federalism uh, uh, in February. So really, I would like to thank uh, this uh, uh, institution. And uh, of course, uh, the uh, local communities of South Tyrol, Comunità Comprensoriali, Alto Adige, because they, they were involved uh, in, the, in the preparation of these events. So I think that uh, I can, I can uh, uh, leave you uh, the stage, Susan, for uh, uh, last uh, words here. And, uh, and then uh, I would like to thank everyone once again. Yes, uh, thank you um, hugely. I am very grateful for everyone in attendance, everyone who made this uh, lecture happen finally. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and especially you, Andrea and Clara, um, uh, Yurak, everyone, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you to everyone. Hoping to see you and to meet you in person finally in, in Italy and in South Tyrol in the future so thank you to everyone for participating to this uh, conference uh, to our president uh, for being with us uh, till the end of the lecture and hoping to see you soon all together thank you and good evening good night thank you bye-bye